but I hope your lordship thinks not him a soldier. Yes, my lord, and a very valiant approve. You have it from his own deliverance. And by other warranted testimony. Then my dial goes not true. I took this lark for a bunting. I do assure, my lord, he is very great in knowledge and accordingly valiant. I have then sinned against his experience and transgressed against his valour, and my state that way is dangerous, since I cannot yet find in my heart to repent. Here he comes. I pray you, make us friends. I will pursue the amity. <coughs> These things shall be done, sir. <laughs> Pray you, sir, who's his tailor? Sir. Oh, I know him well, I, sir. He, sir, is a good workman, a very good tailor. Is she gone to the king? She is. Will she away tonight? As you have her. I've writ my letters, casketed my treasure, given order for our horses, and tonight, when I should take possession of the bride, end ere I do begin. <laughs> a good traveller is something at the latter end of a dinner, but one that lies three-thirds and uses a known truth to pass a thousand nothings with should be once heard and thrice beaten. God save you, Captain. Is there any unkindness between my lord and you, monsieur? Oh, I know not how I've deserved to run into my lord's displeasure. You have made shift to run into it. Boots, spurs and all, like him that <laughs> leapt into the custard. And out of it you'll run again, rather than suffer question for your residence. Maybe you have mistaken him, my lord. And shall do so ever, though I took him at prayers. Fare you well, my lord, and believe this of me. There can be no colonel in this light nut. <laughs> the soul of this man is his clothes. Trust him not in matter of heavy consequence. I have kept of them tame and know their natures. Farewell, monsieur. <laughs> I have spoken better of you than you have or will to deserve at my hand. But we must do good against evil. <laughs> An idle lord, I swear. I think so. Why, do you not know him? Yes, I do know him well. And common speech gives him a worthy pass. Here comes my clog. I have, sir, as I was commanded from you, spoke with the king and have procured his leave for present parting. Only he desires some private speech with you. I shall obey his will. <laughs> you must not marvel, Helen, at my course, which holds not colour with the time, nor does the ministration and required office on my particular. Prepared I was not for such a business. Therefore am I found so much unsettled. This drives me to entreat you that presently you take your way for home. And rather muse than ask why I entreat you. For my respects are better than they seem. And my appointments have in them a need greater than shows itself at the first view to you that know them not. This to my mother. It will be two days ere I shall see you, so I leave you to your wisdom. Sir, I can nothing say but that I am your most obedient servant. Come, come, no more of that. And ever shall, with true observance seek to eke out that wherein toward me my homely stars have failed to equal my great fortune. Let that go. My haste is very great. Farewell. High home. Pray, sir. Your pardon? Well, what would you say? I am not worthy of the wealth I owe, nor dare I say tis mine, and yet it is, but like a timorous thief most fain would steal what law does vouch mine own. What would you have? Something. And scarce so much. Nothing, indeed. I would not tell you what I would, my lord. Faith, yes. Strangers and foes do sunder and not kiss. I pray you stay not, but in haste to horse. I shall not break your bidding, good my lord. Where are my other men, monsieur? Um, Farewell. Go thou toward home, where I will never come whilst I can shake my sword or hear the drum. <laughs> Away, and for our flight. Bravely, Coraggio. So 
that from point to point now have you heard the fundamental reasons of this war, whose great decision hath much blood let forth, and more thirsts after. Holy seems the quarrel upon your grace's part, black and fearful of the opposer. Therefore we marvel much our cousin France would in so just a business shut his bosom against our borrowing prayers. But my lord, the reasons of our state I cannot yield. But, like a common and an outward man that the great figure of a council frames by self-unable motion, therefore dare not say what I think of it, since I have found myself in my uncertain grounds to fail as often as I guessed. Be it his pleasure. But I am sure the younger of our nature that surfeit on their ease will day by day come here for physic. Welcome shall they be, and all the honours that can fly from us shall on them settle. You know your places well. When better fall for your avails, they fell. Tomorrow, to the field. It hath happened all as I would have had it, save that he comes not along with her. By my troth, I take my young lord to be a very melancholy man. By what observance, I pray you? Why, he will look upon his boot and sing, mend the rough and sing, ask questions and sing, pick his teeth and sing. I know a man that had this trick of melancholy sold a goodly manner for a song. Let me see what he writes, and when he means to come. <sighs> I have no mind to Isbel since I was at court. Our old lings and our Isbels of the country are nothing like your old ling and your Isbels of the court. The brains of me cupid's knocked out, and I begin to love as an old man loves money, with no stomach. What have we here? Ain't that you have there. I have sent you a daughter-in-law. She hath recovered the king, and undone me. I have wedded her, not bedded her, and sworn to make the knot eternal. You shall hear I am run away. Know it before the report come. If there be breadth enough in the world, I will hold a long distance. My duty to you, your unfortunate son, Bertram. This is not well, rash and unbridled boy, to fly the favours of so good a king to pluck his indignation on thy head by the misprising of a maid too virtuous for the contempt of empire? Oh, madam, yonder's heavy news with him between two soldiers and my young lady. What is the matter? Nay, there's some comfort in the news, some comfort. His son will not be killed so soon as I thought he would. Why should he be killed? Well, so say I, madam, if he run away, as I hear he does. The danger is in standing to it. That's the loss of men, though it be the getting of children. <laughs> Here they come, we'll tell you more. For my part, I only hear your son was run away. Save you good, madam. Madam, my lord is gone, forever gone. Do not say so. Think upon patience. Pray, your gentlemen, I have felt so many quirks of joy and grief that the first face of neither on the start can woman me unto it. Where is my son, I pray you? Madam, he's gone to serve the Duke of Florence. We met him thitherward, for thence we came, and after some dispatch and hand at court, thither we bend again. Look on his letter, madam. Here's my passport. When thou canst get the ring upon my finger, which never shall come off and show me a child, begotten of thy body that I am father to, then call me husband. But in such a then, I write, a never. This is a dreadful sentence. Brought you this letter, gentlemen? Aye, madam. And for the content's sake, are sorry for our pains. I pray thee, lady, have a better cheer. If thou engrossest all the griefs are thine, thou robst me of a moiety. He was my son, but I do wash his name out of my blood, and thou art all my child. Towards Florence, is he? Aye, madam. And to be a soldier? Such is his noble purpose, and believe it. The Duke will lay upon him all the honour that good convenience claims. Return you thither. Aye, madam, with the swiftest wing of speed. Till I have no wife, I have nothing in France. Tis bitter. Find you that there? Aye, madam. Tis but the boldness of his hand, haply, which his heart was not consenting to. Nothing in France until he have no wife. There's nothing here that is too good for him, but only she. 
And she deserves a lord that twenty such rude boys might tend upon and call her hourly mistress. Who was with him? A servant only, and a gentleman which I have sometime known. Parolas, was it not? Aye, my good lady, he. A very tainted fellow, and full of wickedness. My son corrupts a well-derived nature with his inducement. Indeed, good lady. The fellow has a deal of that too much, which holds him much to have. You are welcome, gentlemen. I will entreat you, when you see my son, to tell him that his sword can never win the honour that he loses. More I'll entreat you, written to bear along. We serve you, madam, in that and all your worthiest affairs. Not so, but as we change our courtesies. Will you draw near? Till I have no wife, I have nothing in France. Nothing in France until he has no wife. Thou shalt have none, Rosilian, none in France. Then hast thou all again. Oh, poor Lord, is't I that chase thee from thy country and expose those tender limbs of thine to the event of the non-sparing war? And is it I that drive thee from the sportive court, where thou wast shot at with fair eyes to be the mark of smoky muskets? O oh, you leaden messengers, that ride upon the violent speed of fire, fly with false aim, move the still piecing air that sings with piercing, do not touch, my lord. Whoever shoots at him, I set him there. Whoever charges on his forward breast, I am the caitiff that do hold him to it. And though I kill him not, I am the cause his death was so affected. Better twere, I met the raven lion when he roared with sharp constraint of hunger. Better twere that all the miseries which nature owes were mine at once. No, come thou home, Rosilian. Whence honour but of danger wins a scar, as oft it loses all. I will be gone. My being here it is that holds thee hence. Shall I stay here to do it? No. No. Although the air of paradise did fan the house and angels officed all, I will be gone that pitiful rumour may report my flight to consolate thine ear. Come, night, end day, for with the dark, poor thief, I'll steal away. The general of our horse thou art, and we, great in our hope, Lay our best love and credence upon thy promising fortune. Sir, it is a charge too heavy for my strength, but yet will strive to bear it for your worthy sake to the extreme edge of hazard. Then go thou forth, and fortune play upon thy prosperous helm as thy auspicious mistress. This very day, great Mars, I put myself into thy file. Make me but like my thoughts, and I shall prove a lover of thy drum, hater of love. <laughs> Of her? Might you not know she would do as she has done by sending me a letter? Read it again. I am St. Jaquis Pilgrim, thither gone. Ambitious love hath so in me offended that barefoot plod I the cold ground upon with sainted vow my faults to have amended. Write. Write that from the bloody course of war my dearest master, your dear son, may hie. Bless him at home in peace whilst I from far his name with zealous fervour sanctify. His taken labours bid him me forgive. I, his despiteful Juno, sent him forth from courtly friends with camping foes to live where death and danger dogs the heels of worth. He is too good and fair for death and me, whom I myself embrace to set him free. Ah, oh, what sharp stings are in her mildest words. Ronaldo, you did never lack advice so much as letting her pass so. Had I spoke with her, I could have well diverted her intents, which thus she hath prevented. Pardon me, madam. If I had given you this at overnight, she might have been urtain. And 
Yet she writes pursuit would be but vain. What angel shall bless this unworthy husband? He cannot thrive unless her prayers, whom heaven delights to hear and loves to grant, reprieve him from the wrath of greatest justice. Write, write, Rinaldo, to this unworthy husband of his wife. Let every word weigh heavy of her worth that he does weigh too light. My greatest grief, though little he do feel it, set down sharply. Dispatch the most convenient messenger. When happily he shall hear that she is gone, he will return, and hope I may that she, hearing so much, will speed her foot again, led hither by pure love. Which of them both is dearest to me? I have no skill in sense to make distinction. Provide this messenger. My heart is heavy, and my age is weak. Grief would have tears, and sorrow bids me speak. Come, for if they do approach the city, we shall lose all the sight. They say the French Count has done most honourable service. It is reported that he has taken their greatest commander, and that with his own hand he slew the Duke's brother. Oh, we have lost our labour. They are gone a contrary way. Hark, you may know by their trumpets. Come, let's return again, and suffice ourselves with the report of it. Well, Diana, take heed of this French Earl... The honour of a maid is her name, and no legacy is so rich as honesty. I have told my neighbour how you have been solicited by a gentleman his companion. I know that knave hanging. One Paroles. A filthy officer he is in those suggestions for the young earl. Beware of them, Diana. Their promises, enticements, oaths, tokens and all these engines of lust are not the things they go under. Many a maid hath been seduced by them, and the misery is example that so terrible shows in the rack of maidenhood cannot, for all that, dissuade succession, but that they are lined with the twigs that threatens them. I hope I need not to advise you further, but I hope your own grace will keep you where you are, though there were no further danger known but the modesty which is so lost. You shall not need to fear me. I hope so. Look, here comes a pilgrim. I know she will lie at my house, thither they send one another. I'll question her. God save you, pilgrim. Whither are you bound? Uh, to St. Jacques Le Grand. Where do the palmer's lodge, I do beseech you? At the St. Francis, here beside the port. Is this the way? I marry ist. Hark you, they come this way. If you will tarry, holy pilgrim, but till the troops come by, I will conduct you where you shall be lodged. The rather, for I think I know your hostess as ample as myself. Is it yourself? If you shall please so, pilgrim. I thank you, and will stay upon your leisure. You came, I think, from France. I did so. Here you shall see a countryman of yours that has done worthy service. His name, I pray you, the Count Rossilian. Know you such a one, but by the ear, that he is most nobly of him. His face I know not. Whatsoever he is, he's bravely taken here. He stole from France, as tis reported, for the king had married him against his liking. Think you it is so? I, surely, mere the truth, I know his lady. There is a gentleman that serves the count, reports but coarsely of her. What's his name? Monsieur Parolas. Ah, oh, I believe with him. In argument of praise or to the worth of the great count himself, she is too mean to have her name repeated. All her deserving is a reserved honesty, and that I have not heard examined. Alas, poor lady. Tis a hard bondage to become the wife of a detesting lord. I write, good creature, wheresoe'er she is, her heart weighs sadly. This young maid might do her a shrewd turn, if she please. How do you mean? Maybe the amorous count solicits her in the unlawful purpose. He does indeed and brokes with all that can in such a suit corrupt the tender honour of a maid. But she is armed for him, and keeps her guard in honestest defence. The gods forbid else. So now they come! That is Antonio, the Duke's eldest son. And that Aeschylus! Which is the Frenchman? He, that with the plume. Tis a most gallant fellow. I would he loved his wife. If he were honester, he were much goodlier. 
this not a handsome gentleman? I like him well. Tis pity he is not honest. Yon's that same knave that leads him to these places. Were I his lady, I would poison that vile rascal. Which is he? That jackanapes with scarves. Why is he melancholy? Perchance he is hurt of the battle. He's shrewdly vexed at something. Mariana! Look, he spied us. Mary, hang you! And your courtesy for a ring carrier? The troop is past. Come, pilgrim. I will bring you where you shall host. Of enjoined penitents, there's four or five to Great St. Jaques bound already at my house. I humbly thank you. Please let this matron and this gentle maid to eat with us tonight. The charge and thanking shall be for me. And to requite you further, I will bestow some precepts of this virgin worthy the note. We'll take your offer kindly. Nay, good my lord, put him to it. Let him have his way. If your lordship find him not a hilding, hold me no more in your respect. About my life, my lord, a bubble. Do you think I am so far deceived in him? Believe it, my lord, in mine own direct knowledge without any malice. But to speak of him as my kinsman, he's a most notable coward. An infinite and endless liar, an hourly promise breaker, the owner of no one good quality worthy your lordship's entertainment. It were fit you knew him. Lest reposing too far in his virtue, which he hath not, he might at some great and trusty business in a main danger uh, fail you. I would I knew in what particular action to try him. Well, none better than to let him fetch off his drum, <laughs> which you hear him so confidently undertake to do. I, with a troop of Florentines, will suddenly surprise him. Such I will have, whom I'm sure he knows not from the enemy. We will bind and hoodwink him so that he shall suppose no other but that he is carried into the leaguer of the adversaries when we bring him to our own tents. <laughs> <laughs> we were to your lordship present at his examination if he do not, for the promise of his life and in the highest compulsion of base fear, offer to betray you and deliver all the intelligence in his power against you and that with the divine forfeit of his soul upon oath, Never trust my judgment in anything. Oh, for the love of laughter, let him fetch his drum. He says he has a stratagem for it. When your lordship sees the bottom of his success in and to what metal this counterfeit lump of ore will be melted, if you give him not John Drum's entertainment, your inclining cannot be removed. Oh, for the love of laughter, hinder not the honour of his design. Let him fetch off his drum in any hand. How oh, now, monsieur? Ah. This drum sticks sorely in your disposition. Oh. A pox on. Let it go. Tis but a drum. But a drum? Is but a drum? A drum so lost. There was excellent command to charge in with our horse upon our own wings and to rend our own soldiers. That was not to be blamed in the command of the service. Not to it be... was a disaster of war that Caesar himself could not have prevented <laughs> if he had been there to command. Well, we cannot greatly condemn our success. Some dishonour we had in the loss of that drum, but it is not to be recovered. It might have been recovered. It might, but it is not now. It is to be recovered. But that the merit of service is seldom attributed to the true and exact performer, I would have that drum, or another, or hick yak it. Why, if you have a stomach, toot, monsieur, if you think your mystery and stratagem can bring this instrument of honour again into his native quarter, be magnanimous in the enterprise and go on. I will grace the attempt for a worthy exploit. If you speed well in it, the Duke shall both speak of it and extend to you what further becomes his greatness, even to the utmost syllable of your worthiness. By the hand of a soldier, I will undertake it. But you must not now slumber in it. I'll about it this evening, and I will presently pen down my dilemmas, encourage myself in my certainty, put myself into my mortal preparation, and by midnight, look to hear further from me. May I be bold mm. to acquaint His Grace who are gone about it? Well, I, I know not what the success will be, my lord, but the attempt I vow... I know that, Valiant, and to the possibility of thy soldiership will subscribe for thee. Farewell. I love not many words. No, I love not many words. <laughs>
<laughs> no more than a fish loves water. <laughs> Is not this a strange fellow, my lord, that so confidently seems to undertake this business? which he knows is not to be done. Damns himself to do and dares better be damned than to do it. You do not know him, my lord, as we do. Certain it is that he will steal himself into a man's favour and for a week escape a great deal of discoveries, but when you find him out, you have him ever after. Well, do you think he will make no deed at all of this that so seriously he does address himself unto? None in the world, but return with an invention and clap upon you two or three probable lies. But we have almost embossed him. You shall see his fall tonight. For indeed, he is not for your lordship's respect. We'll make you some sport with the fox ere we case him. <laughs> he was first smoked by the old Lord Lefeu. When his disguise and he is parted, tell me what a sprat you shall find him, <laughs> which you shall see this very night. I must go look my twigs. He shall be caught. Your brother, he shall go along with me. As please your lordship. I'll leave you. Now will I lead you to the house and show you the lass I spoke of. But you say she's honest. That's all the fault. I spoke with her but once and found her wondrous cold, but I sent to her by this same coxcomb that we have in the wind tokens and letters which she did resend. And this is all I've done. She's a fair creature. Will you go see her? With all my heart, my lord. <laughs> If you misdoubt me that I am not she, I know not how I shall assure you further, but I shall lose the grounds I work upon. Though my estate be fallen, I was well born, nothing acquainted with these businesses, and would not put my reputation now in any staining act. Nor would I wish you. First, give me trust. The county is my husband, and what to your sworn counsel I have spoken is so from word to word. And then you cannot, by the good aid that I of you shall borrow, err uh, in bestowing it. I should believe you, for you have showed me that which well approves you are great in fortune. <sighs> Take this purse of gold. And let me buy your friendly help thus far, which I will overpay and pay again when I have found it. The Count, he woos your daughter, lays down his wanton siege before her beauty, resolved to carry her. Let her, in fine, consent, as we'll direct her how tis best to bear it. Now, his important blood will not deny that she'll demand... A ring the county wears that downward hath succeeded in his house from son to son, some four or five descents since the first father wore it. This ring he holds in most rich choice. Yet in his idle fire, to buy his will, it would not seem too dear how e'er repented after. Now I see the bottom of your purpose. You see it lawful, then. It is no more but that your daughter, ere she seems as one, desires this ring, appoints him an encounter, in fine, delivers me to fill the time herself most chastely absent. After, to marry her, I'll add three thousand crowns to what is past already. I have yielded. Oh. Instruct my daughter how she shall persever that time and place with this deceit so lawful may prove coherent. Every night he comes with musics of all sorts and songs composed to her unworthiness. It nothing steads us to chide him from our eaves, for he persists as if his life lay on. <laughs> Why then, tonight, let us assay our plot, which, if its speed is wicked meaning in a lawful deed and lawful meaning in a lawful act, were both not sin and yet a sinful fact. But let's about it. <laughs> He can come no other way but by this hedge corner. When you sally upon him, speak what terrible language you will. <laughs> Though you understand it not yourselves, no matter. For we must not seem to understand him unless someone among us whom we must produce for an interpreter. Oh, God, oh, Captain, oh. let me be the interpreter. I'm not acquainted with him. No, she not thy voice. No, sir, I warrant you. But what Lindsay Wolsey is out to speak to us again. In such as you speak to me. <laughs> <laughs> he must think us some band of strangers at the adversary's entertainment. Now, he had a smack of all neighbouring languages, therefore we must every one be a man of his own fancy. 
Not to know what we speak one to another, so we seem to know, is to know straight our purpose. Chuff's language, gabble enough and good enough. But as for you, interpreter, you must seem very politic. But couch, oh, here he comes. Shh. To beguile two hours in a sleep and then to return and swear the lies he forges. Hmm. Ten o'clock. Within these three hours, there will be time enough to go home. What shall I say I've done? It must be a very plausive invention that carries it. They begin to smoke me. And disgraces have of late knocked too often at my door. I find my tongue is too foolhardy. But my heart hath the fear of Mars before it and of his creatures, not daring the reports of my tongue. This is the first truth that e'er thine own tongue was guilty of. What the devil should move me to undertake the recovery of this drum, being not ignorant of the impossibility and knowing I had no such purpose? I must give myself some hurts and say I got them in exploit. Yet slight ones will not carry it. They will say, came you off with so little, and great ones I dare not give. Wherefore, what's the instance? Tongue, I must put you into a butter woman's mouth and buy myself another of Badgerzet's mule if you prattle me into these perils. Is it possible he should know what he is and be that he is? <laughs> I would the cutting of my garments would serve the turn, or the breaking of my Spanish sword. Oh, we cannot afford you, sir. Or the bearing of my beard, and to say it was in stratagem. It would not do. Or to drown my clothes and say I was stripped. Hardly, sir. Though I swore I leapt from the window of the citadel. How deep? Thirty fathom. <laughs> Three great O's would scarce make that be believed. I would I had any drum of the enemies, I would swear I recovered it. You shall hear one and on. A drum now of the enemies. I know you are the Muscos Regiment, and I shall lose my life for want of language. <laughs> if, if there be here German or Dane, Low Dutch, Italian or French, let him speak to me. I'll discover that which shall undo the Florentine. Boscos, I understand thee and can speak thy tongue. Oh. Carely bonto, sir, betake thee to thy faith, for seventeen poignards are at thy bosom. The general is content to spare thee yet, oh. and hoodwinked oh. as thou art, will lead thee on to gather from thee. Happily thou mayst inform something to save thy life. Oh, let me live, and all the secrets of our camp I'll show. Their force, their purposes, now I'll speak that which you will wonder at. What wilt thou faithfully? If I do not, damn me. Accord, <laughs> <laughs> Go tell the Count Rossillian and my brother we have caught the woodcock and will keep him muffled till we do hear from them. Captain, I will. I uh, will betray us all unto ourselves. Inform on that. So I will, sir. Uh, till then, I'll keep him dark and safely locked. <laughs> They told me that your name was Fontibel. No, my good lord, Diana. Titled goddess, and worth it with addition. But fair soul, in your fine frame hath love no quality. If the quick fire of youth light not your mind, you are no maiden but a monument. When you are dead, you should be such a one as you are now, for you are cold and stern. And now you should be as your mother was when your sweet self was got. She then was honest. So should you be. No. My mother did but duty. Such, my lord, as you owe to your wife. No more of that. I prithee, do not strive against my vows. I was compelled to her, but I love thee by love's own sweet constraint and will forever do thee all rights of service. Aye, so you serve us till we serve you. But when you have our roses, 
You barely leave our thorns to prick ourselves and mock us with our bareness. How have I sworn? Tis not the many oaths that makes the truth, but the plain single vow that is vowed true. What is not holy, that we swear not by, but take the highest to witness. Then pray you tell me. If I should swear by Jove's great attributes, I loved you dearly, would you believe my oaths when I did love you ill? This has no holding. To swear by him whom I protest to love that I will work against him. Therefore your oaths are words and poor conditions but unsealed. At least in my opinion. Change it. Change it. Be not so wholly cruel. Love is holy. And my integrity ne'er knew the crafts that you do charge men with. Stand no more off, but give thyself unto my sick desires. Who then recovers? Say thou art mine, and ever my love as it begins shall so persever. I see that men may ropes in such a snare that we'll forsake ourselves. Give me that ring. I'll lend it thee, my dear, but have no power to give it from me. Will you not, my lord? It is an honour longing to our house. Bequeathed down from many ancestors, which were the greatest obloquy of the world in me to lose. Mine honour's such a ring. My chastity is the jewel of our house. Bequeathed down from many ancestors, which were the greatest obloquy in the world in me to lose. Thus your own proper wisdom brings in the champion honour on my part against your vain assault. Here, take my ring. My house, mine honour, yea, my life be thine, and I'll be bid by thee. When midnight comes, knock at my chamber window. Our Lord to take my mother shall not hear. Now will I charge you in the band of truth. When you have conquered my yet maiden bed, remain there but an hour, nor speak to me. My reasons are most strong, and you shall know them, when back again this ring shall be delivered, and on your finger in the night I'll put another ring, that what in time proceeds may token to the future our past deeds. Adieu till then, then fail not. <laughs> you have won a wife of me, though there my hope be done. A heaven on earth I have won by wooing thee. For which live long to thank both heaven and me. You may so in the end. My mother told me just how he would woo, as if she sat in his heart. She says all men have the like oaths. He had sworn to marry me when his wife's dead. Therefore I'll lie with him when I am buried. Since Frenchmen are so braid, marry that will. I live and die a maid. Only in this disguise I think no sin to cousin him that would unjustly win. given him his mother's letter. I have delivered it an hour since. There is something in it that stings his nature. For on the reading it, he changed almost into another man. He has much worthy blame laid upon him for shaking off so good a wife and so sweet a lady. Especially he hath incurred the everlasting displeasure of the king, who had even tuned his bounty to sing happiness to him. I will tell you a thing, but you shall let it dwell darkly with you. When you have spoken it, tis dead, and I am the grave of it. He hath perverted a young gentlewoman here in Florence, of a most chaste renown, mm. and this night he fleshes his will in the spoil of her honour. <laughs> he hath given her his monumental ring, oh. and thinks himself made in the unchaste composition. Now, oh, God delay our rebellion. As we are ourselves, what things are we? Merely our own traitors. And as in the common course of all treasons, we still see them reveal themselves mm. till they attain to their abhorred ends. So he that in this action contrives against his own nobility in his proper stream o'erflows himself. Is it not damnable in us to be trumpeters of our unlawful intents? 
We shall not then have his company tonight. Not till after midnight, for he is dieted to his hour. That approaches apace. Uh, I would gladly have him see his company anatomized, that he might take a measure of his own judgments, wherein so curiously he had set this counterfeit. We will not meddle with him till he come, mm. for his presence must be the whip of the other. In the meantime, what hear you of these wars? I hear there is an overture of peace. Nay, I assure you, a peace concluded. What will Count Rochillian do then? Would he travel higher or return again into France? <laughs> I perceive by this demand you're not altogether of his counsel. Let it be forbid, sir. So should I be a great deal of his act. Sir, his wife, some two months since, fled from his house. Her pretense is a pilgrimage to Saint Jacques le Grand, which, wholly undertaking with most austere sanctimony, she accomplished. And there residing, the tenderness of her nature became as a prey to her grief. In fine, made a groan of her last breath, and now she sings in heaven. How is this justified? The stronger part of it by her own letters, which makes her story true even to the point of her death. Her death itself, which could not be her office to say, has come, was faithfully confirmed by the rector of the place. Hath the Count all this intelligence? Mm. Aye, and the particular confirmations, point from point to the full arming of the verity. I'm heartily sorry that he'll be glad of this. How mightily sometimes we make us comforts of our losses. And how mightily some other times we drown our gain in tears. The great dignity that his valour hath here acquired for him shall at home be encountered with a shame as ample. The web of our life is of a mingled yarn, good and ill together. Our virtues would be proud if our faults whipped them not, and our crimes would despair if they were not cherished by our virtues. Now, now, where's your master? You met the Duke in the street, sir, of whom he hath taken a solemn leave. His lordship will next morning for France. The Duke hath offered him letters of commendations to the king. Mm. There shall be no more than needful there. If they were more than they can commend, <laughs> they cannot be too sweet for the king's tartness. Oh. Here's his lordship now. Ah. How now, my lord? Uh. It's not after midnight. I have tonight dispatched 16 businesses a month's length apiece. By an abstract of success, I have conjured with the Duke, done my adieu with his nearest, buried a wife, mourned for her, writ to my lady mother I'm returning, entertained my convoy, and between these main parcels of dispatch effected many nicer needs. The last was the greatest, but that I've not ended yet. Mm -hmm. If the business be of any difficulty in this morning you'll depart your hence, it requires haste of your lordship. I mean the business is not ended as fearing to hear of it hereafter. Uh. But shall we have this dialogue between the fool and the soldier? Come, bring forth this counterfeit module. He's deceived me like a double-meaning prophesy. Yeah, bring him forth. Has <laughs> uh, sat in the stocks all night, poor gallant knave. No matter, his heels have deserved it in usurping his spurs so long. How does he carry himself? I've told your lordship already. The stocks carry him. <laughs> but to answer as you would be understood, he weeps like a wench that has shed her milk. He hath confessed himself to Morgan, whom he supposes to be a friar, from the time of his remembrance to this very instant disaster of his setting of the stocks. And what, think you, he hath confessed? Nothing of me, is it? His confession is taken, and it shall be read to his face. If your lordship be in, as I believe you are, you must have the patience to hear it. <laughs> Plague upon him. Muffled. He can say nothing of me. Hush, hush. Hoodman comes. Porto Tarta Rosa. He calls for the tortures. <laughs> what will you say without them? <laughs> I will confess what I know without constraint. If you pinch me like a pasty, I can say no more. Bosco Cimercio. <laughs> Bobli Bindo. Cerco Marco. You are a merciful general. <laughs> Our general bids you answer to what I shall ask you <sighs> out of a note. And truly as I hope to live. First, demand of him how many horse the Duke is strong. What say you to that? If I owe six thousand, but very weak and unserviceable, the troops are all scattered and the commanders very poor rogues. Upon my reputation and credit to this, I hope to live. Shall I set down your answer, so? I do. I'll take the sacrament on, how and which way you will. All's one to him. What a past-saving slave is this. You're deceived, my lord. This is Monsieur Paroles, the gallant militarist. That was his own phrase, that had the 
Whole theoric of war in the knot of his scarf and the practice in the shape of his dagger. I'll never trust a man again for keeping his sword clean, nor believe he can have everything in him by wearing his apparel neatly. Well, that's set down. Uh, five or six thousand horse, I said. I will say true or thereabouts set down, for I'll speak truth. He's very near the truth in this. But I can't have no thanks for it in the nature he delivers it. Poor rogues, I pray you say. Well, that's set down. I humbly thank you, sir. Truth to truth, the rogues are marvellous poor. Demand of him of what strength they are afoot. What say you to that? Um, uh, by my truth, sir, if I were to live this present hour, I will tell true. Let me see. Spurio, 150. Sebastian, so many. Carambas, so many. Jaquiz, so many. Guilty and Cosmo, Lodovic and Graziae. 250 each. Mine own company, Chitterfer, Vomon, Benti, I, 250 each. So that the muster foul, rotten, and sound upon my life amounts not to 15,000 pole. Half of the which dare not shake the snow from off their cassocks, lest they shake themselves to pieces. What should be done to him? <laughs> Nothing, but let him have thanks. Demand of him my condition, and what credit I have with the Duke. <laughs> Well, that's set down. Oh. <laughs> you shall demand of him whether one Captain Dumain be in the camp, a oh. Frenchman, mm. what his reputation is with the Duke, what his valour, honesty and expertness in wars, or whether he thinks it were not possible, with well-weighing sums of gold, to corrupt him to a revolt. Um. What say you to this? What do you know of it? Uh, I, 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 I beseech you, let me answer to the particular of the interrogatories. Demand them singly. <laughs> do you know this Captain Dumais? Oh, I know him. I was a botcher's prentice in Paris from whence he was whipped for getting the shreves full with child, with some <sighs> innocence that could not say him nay. Oh, nay, God. by your leave, hold your hands, though I know his brains are forfeit to the next tile that falls. Well, is this Captain in the Duke of Florence's camp? Uh, upon my knowledge, he is. And Lousy. <laughs> <laughs> Nay, look not so upon me. We shall hear of your lordship anon. What is his reputation with the Duke? Oh, the Duke knows him for no other but a poor officer of mine, and writ to me this other day to turn him out of the band. I think I have his letter in my pocket. Marry, will you, sir? In good sadness, I do not know. Either it is there, or it is upon a file with the Duke's other letters in my tent. Here it is. Here's a paper. Uh, shall I read it to you? Oh, I, I, I do not know if it be it or no. Our interpreter does it well. Excellently. Diane, what, the uh, Count's a fool what? and full of gold. Oh, that is not the Duke's letter, sir. That is an advertisement to a proper maid in Florence, one Diana, to take heed of the allurement of one Count Rossillian, a foolish idle boy, but for all that very rottish. I pray you, uh, <laughs> I pray you, sir, put it up again. Nay, I'll read it first, by your favour. Uh, my meaning in I protest, was very honest in the behalf of the maid, for I knew the young Count to be a dangerous and lascivious boy who is a whale to virginity and devours up all the fried finds. Damnable both sides rogue. When he swears oaths, bid him drop gold and take it. After he scores, he never pays the score. Mm. Half one is match well made, match and well make it. He ne'er pays after debts, take it before. And say a soldier, Diane told thee this, men are to marry with, boys are not to kiss. Mm. For count of this, the count's a fool, I know it. Who pays before, oh, but not when he, he does, does owe it. it. Yeah. <laughs> Dine as he vowed to thee in thine ear, paroles. Uh, uh. He shall be whipped through the army with this rhyme in his forehead. <laughs> this is your devoted friend, sir, the manifold linguist and the armipotent soldier. Could endure anything before but a cat, and now he's a cat to me. I perceive, sir, by our general's looks, we shall be fain to hang you. <laughs> My life, sir, in any case. Not that I'm afraid to die, but that my offences being many, I would repent out the remainder of nature. Let me live, sir, in a dungeon in the stocks or anywhere, so I may live. We'll see what may be done, <laughs> so you confess freely. Therefore, once more to this uh, Captain uh, Dumain. <laughs> you have answered to his reputation with the Duke and to his valour... What is his honesty? 
He will steal sir an egg out of a cloister. For rapes and ravishments, he parallels Nessus. He professes not keeping of oaths. In breaking of me stronger than Hercules. He will lie, sir, with such volubility that you would think truth were a fool. Drunkenness is his best virtue, for he will be swine drunk, and in his sleep he does little harm, save to his bedclothes about him. But they know his conditions and lay him in straw. I have but little more to say, sir, of his honesty. He has everything that an honest man should not have. What an honest man should have... He has nothing. I begin to love him for this. So this description of thine honesty, a pox upon him for me, is more and more a cat. What say you to his expertness in war? Uh, faith, sir, has led the drum before the English tragedians. Uh, to belie him, I will not, and more of his soldiership I know not, except in that country he had the honour to be the officer at a place there called Mile End, <laughs> to, to instruct for the doubling of files. <laughs> I would do the man what honour I can, but of this I am not certain. He hath out villained villainy so far that the rarity redeems a him. Pox on him, he's a cat still. His qualities being at this poor price, I need not ask you if gold will corrupt him to revolt. Sir, for a card écue, he will sell the fee simple of his salvation, the inheritance of it, and cut the entail from all remainders of a perpetual succession for it perpetually. <laughs> What's his brother, the other Captain uh, Dumain? Why does he ask him of me? What's he? <laughs> he and a crow of the same nest. Not altogether so great as the first in goodness, but greater a great deal in evil. He excels his brother for a coward, yet his brother is reputed one of the best that is. In a retreat, he outruns any lackey, marry and coming on, he has the cramp. <laughs> if your life be saved, will you undertake to betray the Florentine? Aye, and the captain of his horse, Count Rassilian. I'll whisper with the general <laughs> and know his pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll no more drumming, a plague of all drums, only to seem to deserve well and to beguile the supposition of that lascivious young boy the Count of I run into this danger. Yet who would have suspected an ambush where I was taken? There is no remedy, mm. sir, but you must die. <laughs> the general says you that have so traitorously discovered the secrets of your army and made such pestiferous reports of men very nobly held can serve the world for no honest use. Therefore, you must die. <laughs> uh, come, headsman, off with his head! Oh, Lord, sir! Let me live! Oh, let me see my death! That shall you, and take your leave of all your friends. <laughs> So look about you. Know you any here? Good morrow, noble captain. God bless you, Captain Paroles. God save you, noble captain. Captain, what greeting will you to my Lord Lapieux? I am for France. Good captain, <laughs> will you give me a copy of the sonnet you writ to Diana in behalf of the Count Rustillian? And I were not a very coward, I'd compel it of you but fare you well. <laughs> you are undone, Captain. All but your scarf. That has a nut on yet. Who cannot be crushed with a plot? If you could find out a country where but women were that had received so much shame, you might begin an impudent nation. Fare you well, sir. I am for France, too. <laughs> we shall speak of you there. Yet am I thankful, if my heart were great, to it burst at this. Captain, I'll be no more, but I will eat and drink and sleep as soft as Captain shall. Simply the thing I am shall make me live. Who knows himself a braggart, let him fear this, for it will come to pass that every braggart shall be found an ass. Rust sword. Cool blushes and paroles live safest in shame. Being fooled by foolery thrive. There's place and means for every man alive. 
smile after them. <laughs> Thank you.